Section four of Tales of the Uneasy by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. The Operation Part two. The front doorbell rang. She heard Miss Walton's cheery voice making inquiries about Mrs. Mardell's health as she shook the bald snow out of her boots onto the hall mat and plumped her umbrella into the rack. Mrs. Mardell sat still, physically incapable of rising, though she had had but a short bout of pain this time. She had made up her mind to question Miss Walton about Julia. Julia's affairs seemed for the moment essentially her concern. She felt no malevolence towards her in spite of the re-reading of the letter. Miss Walton, the confidant, had never been allowed to see that letter. She should see it now, if she was good and satisfactorily confidential. "'Well, dear, how are you?' Miss Walton had come in, her work-a-day nose reddened with exposure, and her hands thickened with chilblains. "'I suppose you are feeling the continuous cold like the rest of us, and you know, you little minx, that you look best in a tea-gown.' "'Do I look well?' "'Well, a bit bleached, perhaps, and your eyes rather funny and starey, as if you'd been seeing ghosts.' "'Vance has,' she says." A ghost in West Kensington? Nonsense! It was a mock funeral, Vance says, Mrs. Mardell remarked in an even voice, coming out of a house in this street on Christmas Day, when there was nobody died in it, as they told her. She looked closely at Miss Walton's face. Do you know any one at number 13? An actress, Vance says. Bless her! Christmas pudding, I should say! "'No, I don't know a soul in this street besides yourself.' Mrs. Mardell, with a sigh of relief, leant back again. "'But I say, Florence, you do look dicky,' Miss Walton continued. "'What have you been doing with yourself?' "'Perhaps you will say it is Christmas pudding with me, too,' replied Mrs. Mardell, laughing feebly. "'But I don't know. Somehow I've had a horrid day. I seem to have got a sudden attack of lumbago.' or sciatica, or something. It doesn't sound likely at your age. No, does it? But it's pains right through me at intervals all through the day. I had a fearful bout just before you came. I dare say it's nothing. Rheumatism, probably, said the other. Nothing so absurdly painful when it gets hold of one. Here's tea, nice hot tea. It'll do you good. I've had two goes already. Oh, have a third. Nothing like tea for us women. Here, let me pour it out. Your poor little hands are trembling. No, I'll manage. Sugar? I forget if you take it. And lots of milk? Alice, how long is it since you saw Julia? Mrs. Mardell was surprised at the coolness of Miss Walton's reception of the seldom pronounced name. She might have reflected that the other woman had no particular reason to be shy of it for she had been Florence's and Julia's confidant during the stormy times of the divorce, and had managed to be loyal and friendly to both. She now replied off-handedly to Mrs. Mardell's question. Not for six months. Lost sight of the poor dear, rather. And when you last saw her, how did she look? Handsome, but rather too fat. I can't say I much like the look of that, for she's still quite young. I always fancy it means morbid growths and that kind of thing. Poor old Julie. One never even sees her name in the bills now, does one? Retired on the allowance Joe makes her, I suppose, said Florence Mardell bitterly. I can't think how she could bring herself to take his money. Only that she's poor, of course. How poor? One can't tell, replied Alice Walton, with people like Julia. She's Irish. She's the kind of woman who pays a man from Douglas's to come and wave her hair and dry it on towels that you can't see for the holes. You understand. She's the sweetest, cleverest, untidiest soul alive. She took a flat in Paris with a friend, and the state of that flat, I'm told, after a week of Julia, beat even the femme de menage they got in to do for them. They never dressed or ate, but lay about all day in peignoirs and smoked cigarettes. They got in a hypnotist to talk to them about Joe, I believe. Julia makes no secret of her devotion to Joe, as I suppose you are aware. Now, Florence, keep your feet up, there's a good girl. You look ghastly. Yes, I know. 
so she's still mad on joe tell me more about her she isn't a woman of much taste i fancy can't dress a bit no but a generous creature full of impulses and never a mean one among them i do admire her character i confess so do i said florence mardell and so did joe i believe does he can't help seeing her qualities and being flattered by her immense devotion to him though of course he's used to it he can't help being fascinating he's such a sprite and yet so strong julia was as big again as he was pretty nearly he admired her awfully as little men do always admire big women i'm not very big yet joe admires me oh i know he does and long may he continue he may for julia that's one thing she's strictly hands off i know she's never made the slightest attempt to get him ever to go and see her he wouldn't go if she did i shouldn't be too sure of that said miss walton carried by love of her subject beyond the limits of tactfulness and what would it matter joe was truly fond of her till you came along you little witch and she's never done anything to set him against her or hurt his self-love that's what a man minds i don't see how he could have refused her a thing like that nor could you no give her credit for her generosity i believe he proposed it and that she refused to see him steadily nobody in theatrical circles thought for one moment you'd keep him against her the betting was all that if she had tried she'd have got him back in a month no not if she'd tried she wouldn't said florence mardell earnestly she loved him too much her lips sketched a grimace as she spoke her hand moved to her side and her eyes filled with tears what is it dear the pain again i was afraid of it my body was i mean but it luckily doesn't seem to mean business this time and i don't believe i could feel any more i don't seem to have any organs left it's the piece of emptiness exhaustion do dear let me go on talking and thrashing out things what i meant when i said that julia loved him too much was this that it is a mistake to love so openly and make such a noise about it men don't value affection that's cried from the housetops it just disgusts them love at breakfast love at luncheon love all day it's sure to pall love shouldn't be mixed up with daily bread getting it should be a specialty not a sort of smoking mixture advertised on every passing omnibus go on child you interest me why you yourself simply adore joe a fawn-like tormenting expression miss walton had never seen there came over florence mardell's face as in the weak exhausted voice of a privileged invalid she proceeded i adore joe as smart women permit themselves to adore the thing they value and mean to keep i believe i prize joe not for what he is though i'm aware he's a genius but for what he means to me light and kisses and frocks and champagne there isn't so much of that as there would be if julia and her allowance didn't stop the way i love joe because he's the fount of life to me because i feel good when he is in the room and dull when he is out of it i happen to know that i shouldn't feel that about him if he came to me ill and hipped and unsuccessful sounds mean but it's true i perfectly enjoy the placards telling me that he can make a cat laugh and critics saying he is like what garrick used to be an abridgment what is it i am quite cross with him when the notices are poor and i don't in the least long then to take his head on my shoulder and comfort him it's he who has to comfort me julia had a rather different theory yes and julia lost him and i got him she called him her boy and her baby he even told me so saying how nice it was of her quite sincere he thought so i dare say i knew better as if any man liked to be made to feel small she'd have handed the moon down to him if she'd had it in her power and when he cried for such a little easy thing as a divorce of course she gave it to him a fool i call her i don't know about that the friend replied combatively 
greater love hath no woman than she lay down her marriage lines for her husband well i love him but i couldn't have done that i should simply have had to stick to him just the same and then if he had thrown me over nothing would ever have induced me to take money from him but if you were extravagant and nearly starving i'd have found a man to support me and buy me frills then you couldn't have loved him to degrade the thing he had once set store by if joe had left me anything could have become of me for all i cared i see what you are driving at alice you think i can't feel love as julia does because i haven't got beetle brows meeting over my forehead and a big contralto chest to sigh with my way with joe whether i do it from self-control or inclination comes out best a man like joe needs a lot of spoiling but not from the woman he cares for i let outsiders do it for me i don't cosset him or make a point of being home every afternoon from my calls at an unearthly hour to dine with him if a boy offers me a dinner i accept and joe gives me my taxi fare and looks me over and sees that my dress for the other man mind you is all right nor do i wait up for him when he comes back i just see supper's laid out all right and the fire kept up and go to bed i don't make him look ridiculous by fetching him at the theatre as some actors wives do julia i hear used to take parts that didn't suit her so as to ensure her being on the spot with him every night i never know where he is and i don't go getting his pals to play detective and tell me i may be conceited but i do flatter myself that wherever joe is he is thinking of me and of how soon he can get back to me i think you are perfectly right miss walton replied rather sardonically it's the best view to take of marriage and for a woman married to a popular actor the only one do you happen to know where joe is now yes i happen to be able to tell you he is at the theatre rehearsing the new play they must be through by now though he'll be here in a minute I haven't seen him since yesterday. We dine together at six o'clock. And it's half past five now. Well, I must be off. Good-bye, old girl, and I wouldn't neglect those pains if I were you. I expect it's only rheumatism, but as a general rule, internal pains should not be ignored. You look rather flushed. I must go and put on some powder before Joe comes. Good-bye. Tell Gladys to come and clear away the tea as you go out mrs mardell was left alone with two imperfectly drained teacups and some broken crumbs of cake on a japanese tray the spirit lamp under the kettle had gone out she missed its cheerful flame she was hemmed in her knees were imprisoned by the flaps of the tea-table so that she could not lie back she felt disinclined to move and go upstairs for that dust of powder that was to impress joe everything was a bother she felt very stupid but she had no more pain thank god so she sat on waiting for the maid to clear away the tea-things and set her free bolt upright in her hostess corner of the flower begarlanded sofa with the pink shaded lamp behind her convenient for reading only she did not want to read her head drooped till her face was in shadow her eyes were fixed on a liberty cosy corner that adequately filled an ugly bare place in the room but that no one ever sat in and then and there she had a vision it seemed to her that her sight pierced through the faint scaffolding of white wood pillars that bore up the inane piece of furniture she had a view of a cold bare room distempered in pale green and nearly empty of furniture excepting for a bed and an armchair Presently she distinguished a table made of slabs of glass, covered with bits of shining steel and physic bottles. She smelt a strong odour of ether. Then sundry persons surged into her field of vision, though they had been there all the time. Two white-capped nurses, bending solicitously over a bed where a third person lay, with long black hair spread over the pillow a woman who was speaking so faintly that florence felt rather than heard what she said you are sure you have sent for him the image seemed to say urgently nurse nurse it's the quality theatre yes madame we have telephoned through quality theatre it would have been as well 
can you not give us your husband's home address madame i don't know it the patient replied wearily but he will be at the theatre he is always at the theatre it's his life now he'll come he'll come surely madame the nurse turned away to speak to a colleague who had apparently only recently left the room and now returned florence then saw the features of the woman on the bed features never seen by her except across the footlights charged with bright white and rose they were grey and unrecognizable now yet florence knew whose they were she heard the conversation of the two whispering women the while she's sinking fast said the elder nurse she'll last till he comes i think replied the younger he's just telephoned through and he's on his way here with her words the whole house and its ramifications were now revealed to florence mardell as it were the open front of a doll's house she saw the steps leading up to the door there were eight of them the hall the staircase and the room where the patient lay at one and the same time she heard a jingling of bells and the prod of a swift hansom suddenly pulled up at the behest of the urgently waved umbrella of a man within her husband she saw him leap out and dash up the steps to the door that was flung open as soon as he touched the bell she missed no single stage of his progress upstairs to julia's room the nurse opened the door of it admitting him and passed out herself florence recognized joe's familiar gesture the overcoat hastily flung off and thrown aside disclosing the dapper little ordinary man with the long lock of hair that was his mark of genius lifting on his forehead as usual and he impetuously advanced towards the bed she realized the weak complacence that stood for paradisical joy on the face of the woman lying there whose light of life was too nearly extinguished to permit a finer demonstration but the actor's face was a marvel this expression evoked for the beloved dying woman only was of such a tragic madness as no mime could ever hope to originate or imitate florence had never seen that look on his face and sharp knowledge shot through her that even if she in her turn lay dying she would not see it then a sob shook but did not interrupt her steady absorption in the sight spread before her her hungry eyes watched the discreet nurse left in charge retire to the mantelpiece and thoughtfully examine her sleeve-links as the lover with passionate solicitude and a cunning born of intimate usage sat down and laying his arms round his mistress's neck raised her a little so as to gain her ear for the last whispers of love as a ghost to earth returned the second wife apprehended the dreadful sense of the words those two exchanged together joe spoke with no sense of renewal but as if julia and he had parted but a few hours or it may be days ago florence could not resent but she suffered the first pangs of a lifelong sorrow as she listened to julia's faint sighs of content her weak rejoinders to joe's protestations of undying fidelity his vows that turned to old wise baby talk and the promises she wrung from him so easily the nurse still fumbled with her sleeve links blinded by unusual tears you will see me buried julia exacted her hands twisting in joe's hair playing with the long lock you will make all the arrangements for me joe won't you i want you i want you to manage it vance was right joe was the puny ghost mourner and florence looked on eagerly again it shall be our wedding our remarriage he soothed her we meet again to part no more you and i julia my julia what did he mean to do when julia died as die she must it was very near now florence listened and looked their voices seemed fainter more furtive the scene in the bedchamber was growing evanescent ragged as if there were rents in the film she sometimes feared so eager was she to see the whole of her own tragedy that she was beginning to distinguish the wooden lines of the supports of the cosy corner that framed and crossed her view she realized that julia's hour was approaching and that the vision would fade with its instigator the doctor had come in and the other nurse 
she could detect on all three faces the professional discouragement painted there by their foreknowledge of the event they would look cheerful normal again after what must be was over but joe's face surely could never be set in comic lines again those muscles so deeply inured to tragedy might never relax or unbend she knew it when julia died though at the precise moment no one spoke no one moved in the room for a while julia died where she listed where joe would have her in his arms the shape of julia would never go out of them there would never be room there any more for florence whom he had not loved she raised her head with a jerk the pink cushions and hangings of the liberty cosy corner filled up the lines of the woodwork again the pillars framed triviality as usual she was sitting in her own drawing-room and gladys the stupid maid was there just come in to take away the tea-things mrs mardell spoke dinner will be late to-night yes mum i see it's just gone half-past six now your master is kept he has things to see to gladys eager to show she understood interrupted yes mum vance will keep dinner back she folded up the table and set her mistress free mrs mardell had no more pain and knew she would not have any more but she sat on in her place until seven the hour at which her husband usually left for the theatre during this piece in which his part entailed a somewhat lengthy and careful make-up she heard the twist of the latch-key in the door below and for the first time in her life shrank from meeting the eyes of the man she adored with a new and passionate love but it was the lover of julia who would come in to her and say something kind as usual kind merely kind was all he had ever been in all these years of her blindness she put out her hands as if to push him from her and her lips almost framed the words stay oh stay away no use no use her observation tensely quickened told her that he paused in the hall for there was an abrupt cessation of all movement he was hesitating then he made up his mind to the disagreeable duty so florence read the gesture his sturdy dutiful footsteps could be heard ascending a wild whiff of ether seemed to precede him her eyes dropped uncontrollably as he touched and turned the handle of the door gently it was done he was in the room how did he look she must know she raised her sad eyes and contemplated the dwarf actor standing there on the threshold of the pretty cheap drawing-room oppressing appalling her with his overpowering dignity his hair was disordered and clung matted to his damp forehead the long lock fell over it in the style of one of the good-natured roisterers he excelled in portraying but his face had the make-up of a clown the dark features stood out in a mask of putty-coloured whiteness all but the lips which had no red those eyes which had just looked on death stared down on her not unkindly but unseeing she spoke at last to break the awful spell which was winding itself round and round her more than for any other reason julia is dead she said i know he took a step forward into the room and made a cold gesture of menace she recoiled then rose and faced him she died in my arms i loved her he turned away it was as if he had laid a book aside and a leaf had been folded down he muttered with a semblance of forced preoccupation with the business of life i just looked in to tell you that i am going straight back to the theatre without any dinner she shrieked then more calmly well you will have something to eat when you come home won't you what time will that be it was the first time in her life she had asked such a question and his answer to it delivered over his shoulder as he went downstairs cut her to the heart perhaps never scant consolation she knew that he did not mean to kill himself at least not yet for he had promised to make the arrangements for and attend julia's funeral end of section four
Section five of Tales of the Uneasy by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. The Memoir Did women in society ever speak to other women when a man dear to them both was concerned? Had such an outrageous course ever been pursued since the days when Kriemhild spoke to Gudrun in the midst of the Rhine stream? Little Lady Greenwell pondered this time after time, day after day, as she sat dressed in her ineffectual Paris best, alone, in crowds, in sunlight gardens, lamp-lit ballrooms, unlit boudoirs arranged for cosy gossiping teas. She never talked gossip, but she listened to it. A great deal of it covertly was about herself, or rather about her husband. That was one of the reasons why she felt that she ought to speak, speak kindly, seriously, effectively. She fully meant to tell Cynthia what it was her duty to tell her, but she could not make up her mind to take the first plunge into unconventionality. So she sat about through a whole season, watching Sir Hilary's social triumphs, she herself never triumphed, and arranged her speech, carefully composing it beforehand, rehearsing it, canvassing the relative claims of diplomacy and frankness, fullness and brevity, emotion or matter of fact. What arguments should she use, and which let go? Which, having regard to the character of Cynthia Shaney's, would be likely to affect that volatile lady most? Should she plead her own years the more, or her own looks the less? Should she take high and moral grounds? should she put forward the young widow's personal expediency it all depended on what form of admonishment cynthia would take best lady greenwell was honest enough to admit to herself that she proposed to lecture cynthia as much for her own good as cynthia's truly she felt that it would be a difficult thing to keep self out of it or as much in the background as possible just you let my man alone that was what kate of wapping would have said to peg of limehouse and no more ado but could lady greenwell of highfields hungerford and fifty carlton house terrace so bluntly declare herself to the honourable mrs shaney's of portland place did well-bred women do these things it seemed at once so absurdly simple just as you might ask someone to take his foot off your dress and no offence and at the same time so appallingly impossible a thing to do. Women in society were not supposed to show when they were annoyed, ask for explanations, or to act straight. How they suffered in consequence of these absurd fetishes of conduct they set up, women alone knew. Moreover, such a subject, even if it were fairly and squarely discussed between two exceptional women, would represent the merely primitive appeal of the one to the other's generosity, and generosity, though permissible in Wapping or Limehouse, is not the thing in Mayfair or Portland Place. Yet some women were really and truly generous at heart. Cynthia was, she was sure. Had it not been for the presence between them of this male bone of contention, Sir Hilary, Lady Greenwell would have been quite fond of Cynthia Shaney's. She did not dislike her, even now, when Cynthia was making her so uncomfortable, and she admired her sincerely, her frocks and her style. Hilary did, and she could not help following suit in this as in all else. And naturally Cynthia could not help liking Hilary and his open attentions. Who could help liking Hilary and complying with him when he chose to flirt, and he always did choose? He was a born flirt and he was eight years younger than his wife. Wives who were burdened with odious supernumerary years must, of course, give their man a little rope, and Mabel Greenwell gave hers a good deal. Hilary Greenwell was a traveller who came home and wrote books about it. He danced and dashed through a season, and then packed up and went to risk his life on some inaccessible mountain or other. Of course, when he came back, brown as a berry, and with sheaves of notes and measurements, he was the rage, and women simply clawed him for their parties, and adored him for their boudoirs. Cynthia Shaney's was no exception to the rule. Though a widow, she was little more than a girl, and looked a mere child. 
at the parties she gave in her big house so hilary would say you always expected to see the dolls set up and find pips in the orange juice soup and have to mumble the pretend biscuit joint childlike she knew no measure in her appreciation of the handsome traveller returned and people were saying now that she was making a fool of herself and that lady greenwell didn't like it they were wrong there lady greenwell wasn't jealous at all she was sure of hilary and would not have insulted him by display of vulgar jealousy the effect of the scandal on her only amounted to discomfort great discomfort she might say and even annoyance and a few wet pillowed nights loyally concealed from hilary she was neither young nor beautiful it behoved her to be clever she could she knew keep his love though she was unable to restrain those loose tendrils of his fancy which waved airily to and fro catching here and there temporarily on the fair upstanding flowers that bloomed every year in the great parterre of london's garden of seasonal delights hilary loved her and her only she must do nothing foolish whatever she felt whatever she said to cynthia shanies must be a secret for sir hilary a matter between cynthia and herself some women fools thought little lady greenwell would have rushed at once to their husbands with an appeal or a command to put a stop to it at once thus definitely estranging the coveted man without affecting the issue in the desired way no it rested with her and her alone to convince cynthia of the awkwardness of the situation created by cynthia's careless compliance with the fancies of the irresponsible hilary a situation merely irksome to his wife but positively injurious to his wife's friend great interests on either hand were not concerned no one's heart was in it punctuality was lady greenwell's virtue consequently her husband's too she sat on the sofa at the creswicks fan in hand handkerchief in lap the man who was going to take her in stood over her chair uttering the usual commonplaces when the door opened to admit one single smiling lady cynthia shanies late as usual wearing the cluster of flowers she always wore and that every one attributed to sir hilary's devotion lady greenwell happened to know that mrs shanies ordered them at the florist's for herself but how could she tell people that she saw what of course other people saw cynthia's careless delicately possessive glance at sir hilary a glance that effectually singled him out as it were from a group of like-patterned men clustered about the fireplace so stupid of cynthia nothing else of course lady greenwell knew as well as if she had been told that betty creswick would send the two in together suppose she spoke to betty creswick and asked her not to join the tacit conspiracy that prevails in well-regulated pleasure-loving society to give the woman whenever it is possible to the man she is supposed to want never she would die sooner for society would resent such an anti-social proposal and protect its own joys and convenience it must go on although it was making her miserable would this wretched season never come to an end not that she need expect to find any intermission of her troubles even then for there would come visits country housing up and down the length and breadth of england and scotland the three would be asked constantly to meet each other she had been so nice to cynthia that people all thought that lady greenwell had accepted it there would be no rest for her till the late autumn when sir hilary had agreed to go with a party of men on an expedition to locate a continent somewhere he would be away for four months as a loving wife she ought to have dreaded this approaching separation she was shocked to realize that in her heart of hearts she was looking forward to it she would not see the light of his countenance but then neither would the other jealousy makes sad dogs in the manger of us all and she would have the delight of his frequent letters that is unless he wrote to cynthia too if only she had a child cynthia had one cynthia a widow with no husband now to bind faster to her side therewith what a pity it all was dinner was announced sir hilary gave cynthia his arm with a certain look proud protecting sheepish rather 
Yes, she must speak. She placed her hand lightly on the sleeve of she knew not whom, and followed Hilary and Cynthia into the dining-room. She was miserable. She was sure that Hilary, had he but known how unhappy she was making herself, would have tried at once to alter his line of conduct. And he would have failed, of that too, she was sure. Man can do nothing in this line of himself alone, save by the grace of the woman who is leading him astray. It was settled. She must speak to Cynthia. Cynthia Shaney's, who was not lacking in perception, realized at once the meaning of the innocently diplomatic, intensely special glance which Lady Greenwell, placed exactly opposite, fixed upon her as soon as everybody was seated. "'Mabel Greenwell means to speak to me.' She could harbour no other thought from the fish onward. She was a nervous, lazy woman, and the fear of a woman's row was intensely repugnant to her. She hated fuss about men, and bad form, and unconventionality of any kind. Her affair with Sir Hilary, whatever it might mean to her, was openly, at least, quite within the bounds of her world's convention, and she deeply resented any attempt on Lady Greenwell's part to draw it out of its limbo of self-chosen vagueness. To herself she was willing to admit that she loved Sir Hilary very well, nay, desperately, she was less willing to admit that she suffered over this illicit attachment, and yet did suffer a good deal, for she was a good woman, and Lady Greenwell a healthy woman, so the chances were she would never get him honestly. She knew Sir Hilary loved her, was fond of Mabel, and respected them both. That being the case, he would not do either of them a wrong for the whole world. There it was. What an impasse! Three scrupulously honourable people caught in a net. No issue but death, and she could not contemplate even Mabel's death with equanimity. Mabel had been very kind to her, and she and Mabel would have been the greatest friends if Sir Hilary had not stood between them. Though she pitied Mabel for her age, her plainness, she could not help feeling a little angry with Mabel for having presumed to marry Sir Hilary she should not have allowed hilary to persuade her that she was a suitable wife for him hilary was so plausible once however having committed the initial error mabel should not have hoped to keep him except by courtesy she knew sir hilary well enough not to feel obliged to talk to him so she plodded imperturbably through the menu eating a good deal to justify her taciturnity oh i am so hungry she said once or twice I have been down to Brighton to-day to see the boy. Sir Hilary never worried. He quietly looked after her, gave her her own way now as ever. She was heedless. He safeguarded her reputation as well as he could. He never wrote to her when he was away. She would have forgotten to destroy his letters. He called on her not too often. He dined with her now and then, generally with his wife. There was no need to compromise her by overt acts of this sort. The mad, bad, sympathetic world was kind enough to cater for the indulgence of their affection, in all the ragouts of society where they skilfully combined, and discreet opportunities of meeting served up to them daily, with the result that every one was happy and amused, except Lady Greenwell, who had been born and bred in the country, and never could acquire London's cynical tone. Once or twice, however, before this evening, Cynthia had suspected some such strata of unsuspected bourgeois feeling in Mabel. She almost wished Betty Creswick would not be so kind to Hilary and herself, and a little kinder to Mabel. She sometimes even avoided dull parties where she knew he was going. Not so Sir Hilary. He had no scruples of this kind. He adored her, he told her so. And as there's nothing wrong about it all, why shouldn't we see as much of each other as people will let us? Ah, but other people, an ellipsis for Mabel, whom it pleased her to mention to him as little as possible, but he understood in his breezy butterfly way. Mabel's all right. Mabel's a good sort and understands me. She isn't such a fool as to trouble about gossip. He never said more. It was tacitly assumed between them that Mabel was awfully fond of him and all that, but demonstrations would simply bore her, you know. Meanwhile, he loved Cynthia with every fibre of his being, all save the domestic ones, it was understood. 
she was his egeria his goddess his good angel the woman he thought of last thing at night and the first thing on waking in the jungle on the veldt on the frozen himalayan slope he was hers hers only no one else cared not even mabel who had settled down cynthia shanies hardly realized it but this passion had come to be her life she breathed and dressed but for hilary she was a cold woman and content with its platonic manifestations but she technically regretted the immense waste exemplified in the position of the lover tied for all his days to two women neither of whom was or could be everything to him she caught mabel's eye now and again full of timid reticences and prudent punctilios but expressing over and above all others the simple emotion that betrayeth itself in speech i must speak or bust the poor woman fancied mabel saying and shivered over her chocolate mousse the moment came sir hilary left soon after dinner to attend an ethnological society's meeting and lady greenwell timidly offered to motor mrs cheney's home for some fateful reason or other that lady's brougham was not forthcoming it is frightfully out of your way mabel argued the trapped fly gently but firmly the spider informed her that a mere difference of a mile and a quarter did not in the least constitute out of the wayness and the hostess settled it by her vague encouragements so nice of you to chaperone each other like that mrs cheney's hardly grasped the significance of lady creswick's remark until the knees of lady greenwell and herself were safely stowed under the same bearskin rug i wanted to speak to you cynthia began lady greenwell honestly without preface or pretence did you replied the other shrinking as far away from her companion as she could into the corner of the motor then collecting herself she said you can you know it is a little difficult for me but then i must remember it is for your good cynthia oh for my good exclaimed mrs cheney's stung by the familiar too familiar exordium you must remember i am not a mere girl i am a widow that is just it continued lady greenwell delighted a young and with a gulp pretty widow oh don't mention it the other begged her flippantly though her tone grated on and disturbed lady greenwell that lady continued almost apologetically that is the right way to take it dear not seriously just a little hint you know laugh about it as much as you like when i'm done but listen to me for a minute could you not contrive dear to see a little less of hilary my husband i know he's your husband mabel well enough mrs cheney's jerked off crossly and i don't see so much of him as all that oh i know dear i know all about your friendship your intimacy it's nothing at all nothing at all only you see people will talk yes bother them we mustn't pay too much attention to gossip of course but we owe it to ourselves to take some notice of what is said you may want to marry again never oh don't say that pleaded the other pitifully you are sure to so young and pretty but don't you think that meantime that people should couple your name and hilary's is prejudicial rather to you of course i know what that there's nothing at all serious between you nothing at all hilary she blurted out the indecent fact hilary is devoted to me and always has been he has never swerved for the fraction of an instant besides he would not would not what oh cynthia you do make it so difficult you seem so stony you aren't offended no of course not i only wanted to know what it was that hilary wouldn't do her careless use of the beloved's name hurt lady greenwell a good deal she drew herself up would not allow himself to make love to another woman during his wife's lifetime you may as well take that for granted only he is younger than i and heedless and you are most attractive while i am a plain woman well dressed and the world thinks of course the usual thing oh cynthia help me and it would not matter of course if it were not for you and your reputation 
though I can't deny that it makes me very uncomfortable to hear him lightly spoken of. What do you want me to do about it? I said what. See less of him. See him only at my house. Will you give him your orders, then, not to call at mine? Dear Cynthia, how could I do that? What do you think of me? I think you are like all women, want to get someone else to pull the chestnuts out of the fire for you. Why should I do your dirty work? And it would not do, either. I couldn't forbid him my house without creating remark, and doing exactly what you don't want done, getting him talked about. Nor can I go and tell Betty Creswick not to send us in to dinner together. Of course you can't tell her, but there are methods. And I refuse to employ them, and let all the world think I am doing it because I have a guilty conscience, or because you have been making a scene. You don't want that, surely. No, she shuddered. Then it has been no use my speaking practically, and Cynthia, you can have no idea what it has cost me. I am truly sorry, but indeed, dear, this sort of carriage lecture never does any good. You can't have straight talks to women. No woman can employ another woman to help keep her husband for her. It really isn't done. Keep my husband? But have I not been telling you, Cynthia, all this time, that if I thought for one moment that my husband had been unfaithful to me in word or thought or deed, I would not have spoken to anybody at all about it. I would just have died. It is precisely because I do believe in him. Then it makes it quite simple. Go on believing in him. You may, replied the other woman, dryly, as the carriage stopped at the door of her own house. Good night, Mabel. Thank you for the lift. And are you cross, Cynthia? Believe me, I meant well. You meant well by yourself, eh, dear? Just realize that you were speaking for yourself. Oh, Cynthia, you are cruel. Yes, but honest. Think it over. Let it all be as if it hadn't been. Shall I kiss you? She paused with a light foot on the step. Yes, please. You know I am really fond of you, Cynthia, but you seem to have beaten me. Oh, no, asseverated Mrs. Shaney's. Only convinced you that these sort of things can't be done. They kissed. I had doubts about the wisdom of it at the time, murmured Lady Greenwell. I thought you might say it was tactless. Hilary says I have no tact. Never mind. You are sure he loves you, and that's better than tact. That's everything. Mrs. Shaney's was shaking out her skirts on the pavement, pulling out her latch-key. So that's all right. There's an end of it. Yes, and come to dinner tomorrow night, will you? Yes, dear. Good night. Two hands met and clasped over the window bar of the carriage. Lady Greenwell watched her friend in and whirled away. Mrs. Shaney's rushed impulsively upstairs to her room, and threw herself on her bed in an agony of weeping. They were tears both for herself and Mabel. It was a year later. Mrs. Shaney's, in modified mourning, for she had made herself as black as she dared, rang for admittance at the door of Greenwell House. The very house seemed in mourning. It used to be furnished exotically, with variegated hangings and things Hilary had brought back from abroad. Cynthia shivered. She had been sent for. Why? Why did Mabel Greenwell want to see her? The cords of their friendship had been sensibly loosened. It was perhaps as well. They mourned in their separate corners of London. She was ushered into the presence of a little woman whose deep official weeds seemed almost to obliterate her slight frame and make her fade into the surrounding blackness. She rushed at and clung to her handsome visitor, and kissed her mournfully and deliberately on both cheeks. "'Dear, dear Cynthia, how good of you to come to me!' "'Dearest Mabel, how good of you to be willing to see me!' "'Oh, I wanted you, somehow, so much. I believe when all is said and done, Cynthia, I am fonder of you than I am of any one.' Mrs. Shaney's winced and suffered herself to be kissed again on both cheeks. She looked extremely handsome in her glowing purples and blues. The widow's inexpressive eyes were merely dimmed and bleared by her tears. Those of Cynthia Shaney's shone, 
and she was not so silly as to redden the lids by dabbing them with a handkerchief, as Lady Greenwell did. "'He was so fond of you, Cynthia. He has left you to me as a sort of legacy. We often spoke of you.' Cynthia started. It had surely been a tacit convention between herself and the dead Hilary that— "'Yes, I ventured at last to tell him about that talk I had with you once, and he took it just as you did. He laughed at me and said that I had no right to worry you with that sort of thing, and that you were perfectly justified in being short with me, as you were, Cynthia, you know. He thought it very nice of you to forgive me, and go on seeing us as usual. Yes, but I saw very little of him alone after that. He went away soon after, didn't he? That was perhaps a good thing. It gave one time. I don't think you had any need to tell him. Oh, my dear, what could it matter? There was such perfect confidence between us, and I preferred that a trifling incident like that should not be allowed to interfere with it. Surely you don't mind. Not now, replied Cynthia Shanies, with an effort, and I suppose you had a perfect right to do as you liked about it. That's all right, then. And Hilary said, dear thing, when he left me to go on that wretched expedition that killed him, that I was to be as nice to you as I could, and see as much of you as you would allow me to do, and so I have, and so I mean to. Don't, don't cry so, dear. Oh, do let me cry, it helps me, and how can I help it when I think of the dearest husband ever woman had? Lost to me, gone, gone, killed, out there alone among horrid savages. Why, Cynthia, you are crying too. I can't help it either, said the other savagely, disdaining to wipe her tears away. Cynthia, you were fond of him too. Now don't say you were not. I was. Lady Greenwell rose. She looked taller. She looked grim. And that is the reason, I thought. I made up my mind that you were the proper person to consult about this. This? asked the other, following the direction of those sad, sunken eyes. Yes, it was his last wish, Cynthia. Lady Greenwell pointed to a large, bulging packet, lying with a magnificent despatch box close to her elbow, and continued in her thin, nervous, passionate voice. You know, when he got ill over there, it came on so gradually, he never ceased writing to me till the very last. He got his secretary to send home the manuscript of his new book to me. He wanted me to see to the publication of it. I was to edit it if he never came back to do it himself, and I was to ask you to be co-editress. Good God! Oh, don't be frightened, dear. There's nothing to do. It is all done. I did it. Only, as he said you were to see it before it came out, I could not but prepare to carry out his dear wishes. And now I must tell you, as he is gone, I should like to call it Memorials of a Noble Soul, something like that, and add some of his letters to me. I have them all here, in this despatch box. I never destroyed a single line of dear darling Hillary's. They will make a most interesting book, murmured Mrs. Shaney's, looking away. Yes, won't they? Only, of course, Lady Greenwell breathed softly, with a watery smile of triumph. They will want some editing. They are too intimate, too personal for the ear of the general public. It could not be otherwise. But still, I don't think the public should lose because he was in love with his wife, do you? No, certainly not. There is a great deal in them, of purely general interest, of course, but it still wants weeding of lovers' phrases and endearments and so on. So I thought the best plan would be for me to read them all aloud to you, and consult you as to what to be left in or struck out. Cynthia Shaney's groaned aloud. Lady Greenwell smiled. She had gained confidence. Cynthia, dear, how like you! You were always afraid of hard work, and there is nothing, nothing bores you so much as listening. Hilary noticed that. These brilliant women, he used to say, Let's have the letters, ejaculated Mrs. Shaney's bluffly. She adjusted a cushion or two behind her shoulders. I have learnt how to listen lately. Let's have tea first. 
Certainly. Lady Greenwell rang the bell. Tea was brought. The hostess dispensed it. Then, with many a reminiscent pause, and sob, and dab of the handkerchief, Lady Greenwell opened the despatch box and produced letters tied up in blue, Hilary's favourite colour. It was the colour of Cynthia's eyes. She fidgeted in her place, and Lady Greenwell offered her another cushion. "'Because this will all take time. I'll read the first that comes,' the widow of Hilary declared, when they had both settled down. "'I am not afraid of your knowing, Cynthia, how fond he was of me. This one begins, he generally begins so. Dear little woman, we can leave that out, if you like.' "'You can't. It shows character,' observed Mrs. Cheney somberly. "'Go on.' Thus encouraged, Lady Greenwell read, shyly at first, but with gathering confidence, as the map of her husband's affections unrolled itself under her faltering tongue. She read faster. The session was going to last interminably. The letters were good, but long. "'Very vivid. Most interesting,' Mrs. Cheney's remarked now and again, drumming with her foot and with her face turned away. "'It is really rather too intimate,' Lady Greenwell blurted. "'Listen to this. Darling, my darling, I can scarcely bear to read it. All night I lie and toss on my uncomfortable rugs and think, think of you, darling, and your soft breast.' "'You might put cheek there instead of breast, if you liked,' interposed the co-editress hastily. Lady Greenwell looked up. Very well. She used a little pencil at her girdle. Then she resumed. And I realize how the thought of one sweet woman at home can be at once the joy and the torture of the traveller, for I don't know if it is most sweet or most bitter, this remembrance of happier hours in altered circumstances. It is joy, but then sometimes the agony of separation is too keen to bear. Oh, that he should feel it so. I'll go on, Cynthia, if you don't feel too much bored. I stretch out my hands. I look for you, for your warm, kind arms. You certainly will have to strike all those rhapsodies out, Mrs. Shaney's remarked coldly. He must have been very ill, then. Are the letters all like that? If so, they won't make a book of very general interest. Ah! Oh, Lady Greenwell exclaimed. She was tossing over the letters feverishly. They seem to have got mixed. This is one of the English series, written from the Creswick's place. That must have been sent the summer before he went, for that's the only time he ever went to Betty Creswick's alone. It was the very week I spoke to you, Cynthia. I wish you would not keep on bringing that in, interposed Cynthia Shaney's irritably. You were quite right. I was quite wrong. I see that well enough now. Go on. We are both dining out tonight, I suppose. Not I, said Lady Greenwell haughtily. I shall never dine out again. She read on a little to herself. He didn't like being there without me a bit, she murmured. In fact, he loathed it. Why didn't you go with him, then? asked Mrs. Shaney, so she knew well enough. She had been one of the Creswick party and the letter explaining Mabel's reasons for defection had been read aloud to her. But Lady Greenwell couldn't know that. "'Oh, I got a bad chill at the very last moment, and had to wire I couldn't go. Cynthia, shall I read this letter?' "'Of course. It's part of his life, I suppose.' "'My own little brown bird,' read Lady Greenwell softly. "'I was so grieved to leave you, tucked up in bed, a darkened room, and with only a hired nurse to hold your little hot hand. Here I may say I am not enjoying myself a bit, and yet we are a very gay party and everything jolly, but I can't get any fun out of it without you to talk it over with me after we've gone to bed at four in the morning. Dear little woman, why did you make me go alone? The Creswick menage is a bit noisy for your quiet, sober husband." One gets a little tired of the society of brilliant women. They flash and coruscate, and finally weary. I can't help thinking of a certain still, small, brown bird at home, sitting on the bough and waiting for me. Oh, Cynthia, I do believe here is something actually about you. He mentions you by name. 
I'm the brilliant woman that wearies, am I not? Well, let us hear what he says about me. Shall I? I've read them all a hundred times, but I don't quite remember. So if it annoys you, mind, it is your own fault. Here goes. The Cynthia of the minute is really a little overpowering. She seems quite to enjoy saying risque things and compromising herself. I really don't think I ought to read this to you, Cynthia. Read it, or I shall snatch it out of your hands. Well, you are sure you won't mind? Poor little Cynthia. She is astonishingly indiscreet, but she means no harm. She is a dear, nice, ordinary, simple woman, pretending to be a sad rake, but as good as gold, really. As good as gold, really. Well, isn't that nice for him to say that? nice dear boy he always did go straight to the heart of the matter didn't he he was as a matter of fact awfully fond of you and this just shows it he knew you through and through though what's the matter give me some hot water to drink gasped mrs Shaneys. is this your revenge mabel dear cynthia aren't you well you do use such odd stagey words revenge i am your friend and always will be my husband wanted us to be friends. Well, then, do let us keep friends, said Mrs. Shaneys, drinking her scalding hot water hastily and rising. I must go. An early dinner for the theatre. Tommy Vavasor. But what about the letters? I've only read two. Of course you must leave that out about me, said Cynthia, speaking very fast, and knotting her fur round her neck, as if she wanted to throttle herself and all personalities about people still living, and you must not print names. But as for the rest, I should give the letters in their entirety. Go ahead. There's my advice to you. You can hurt no one, and your collaborator gives you carte blanche. She escaped. She preserved no memory of the passage from Lady Greenwell's dull drawing-room to the gaslit street outside. She bitterly resented the dead man's view of her innocent attempts at disillusioning him on the only occasion they had met previously to his departure and after his wife's lecture, and she would have given her best jewel to discover whether Mabel's quite thorough revenge had been carefully planned or not. She married young Lord Vavasor within the year and contrived, without exciting any suspicion, never again to be alone in the same room with the widowed Lady Greenwell again. And she longed, as she had never longed for anything else, to hear of Lady Greenwell's remarriage. End of section 5section six of tales of the uneasy by violet hunt this librivox recording is in the public domain read by lisa reichert the prayer part one one it is but giving over of a game that must be lost philister come mrs arne come my dear you must not give way like this you can't stand it you really can't let miss kate take you away now do urged the nurse, with her most motherly of intonations. "'Yes, Alice, Mrs. Joyce is right. Come away, do come away. You are only making yourself ill. It is all over. You can do nothing. Oh, oh, do come away!' implored Mrs. Arne's sister, shivering with excitement and nervousness. A few moments ago, Dr. Graham had relinquished his hold on the pulse of Edward Arne, with the hopeless movement of the eyebrows that meant the end. The nurse had made the little gesture of resignation that was possibly a matter of form with her. The young sister-in-law had hidden her face in her hands. The wife had screamed a scream that turned them all hot and cold, and flung herself on the bed over her dead husband. There she lay. Her cries were terrible. Her sobs shook her whole body. The three gazed at her pityingly, not knowing what to do next. The nurse, folding her hands, looked towards the doctor for directions, and the doctor drummed with his fingers on the bedpost. The young girl timidly stroked the shoulder that heaved and writhed under her touch. "'Go away! Go away!' her sister reiterated continually, in a voice hoarse with fatigue and passion. 
leave her alone miss kate whispered the nurse at last she will work it off best herself perhaps she turned down the lamp as if to draw a veil over the scene mrs arne raised herself on her elbow showing a face stained with tears and purple with emotion what not gone she said harshly go away kate go away it is my house i don't want you i want no one i want to speak to my husband will you go away all of you give me an hour half an hour five minutes she stretched out her arms imploringly to the doctor well said he almost to himself he signed to the two women to withdraw and followed them out into the passage go and get something to eat he said peremptorily while you can we shall have trouble with her presently i'll wait in the dressing-room he glanced at the twisting figure on the bed shrugged his shoulders and passed into the adjoining room without however closing the door of communication sitting down in an armchair drawn up to the fire he stretched himself and closed his eyes the professional aspects of the case of edward arne rose up before him in all its interesting forms of complication it was just this professional attitude that mrs arne unconsciously resented both in the doctor and in the nurse through all their kindness she had realized and resented their scientific interest in her husband for to them he had been no more than a curious and complicated case and now that the blow had fallen she regarded them both in the light of executioners her one desire expressed with all the shameless sincerity of blind and thoughtless misery was to be free of their hateful presence and alone alone with her dead she was weary of the doctor's subdued manly tones of the nurse's commonplace motherliness too habitually adapted to the needs of all to be appreciated by the individual of the childish consolation of the young sister who had never loved never been married did not know what sorrow was their expressions of sympathy struck her like blows the touch of their hands on her body as they tried to raise her stung her in every nerve with a sigh of relief she buried her head in the pillow pressing her body more closely against that of her husband and lay motionless her sobs ceased the lamp went out with a gurgle the fire leaped up and died she raised her head and stared about her helplessly then sinking down again she put her lips to the ear of the dead man edward dear edward she whispered why have you left me darling why have you left me i can't stay behind you know i can't i am too young to be left it is only a year since you married me i never thought it was only for a year till death do us part yes i know that's in it but nobody ever thinks of that i never thought of living without you i meant to die with you no no i can't die i must not till my baby is born you will never see it don't you want to see it don't you oh edward speak say something darling one word one little word edward edward are you there answer me for god's sake answer me darling i am so tired of waiting oh think dearest there is so little time they only gave me half an hour in half an hour they will come and take you away from me take you where i can't come to you with all my love i can't come to you i know the place i saw it once a great lonely place full of graves and little stunted trees dripping with dirty london rain and gas lamps flaring all round but quite quite dark where the grave is a long grey stone just like the rest how could you stay there all alone all alone without me do you remember edward what we once said that whichever of us died first should come back to watch over the other in the spirit i promised you and you promised me what children we were death is not what we thought it comforted us to say that then now it's nothing nothing worse than nothing i don't want your spirit i can't see it or feel it i want you you your eyes that looked at me your mouth that kissed me she raised his arms and clasped them round her neck and lay there very still murmuring 
Oh, hold me, hold me. Love me if you can. Am I hateful? This is me. These are your arms. The doctor in the next room moved in his chair. The noise awoke her from her dream of contentment, and she unwound the dead arm from her neck, and holding it up by the wrist, considered it ruefully. Yes, I can put it round me, but I have to hold it there. It is quite cold. It doesn't care. Ah, oh, my dear, you don't care. You are dead. I kiss you, but you don't kiss me. Edward, Edward, oh, for heaven's sake, kiss me once, just once. No, no, that won't do. That's not enough. That's nothing, worse than nothing. I want you back. You, all you. What shall I do? I often pray. Oh, if there be a God in heaven, and if he ever answered a prayer, let him answer mine, my only prayer. I'll never ask another, and give you back to me. As you were, as I loved you, as I adored you, he must listen, he must. My God, my God, he's mine. He's my husband, he's my lover. Give him back to me. Left alone for half an hour or more with the corpse, it's not right. The muttered expression of the nurse's revolted sense of professional decency came from the head of the staircase, where she had been waiting for the last few minutes. The doctor joined her. Hush, Mrs. Joyce. I'll go into her now. The door creaked on its hinges as he gently pushed it open and went in. What's that? What's that? screamed Mrs. Arne. Doctor! Doctor! Don't touch me! Either I am dead or he is alive! "'Do you want to kill yourself, Mrs. Arne?' said Dr. Graham, with calculated sternness, coming forward. "'Come away!' "'Not dead! Not dead!' she murmured. "'He is dead, I assure you. Dead and cold an hour ago. Feel!' He took hold of her, as she lay face downwards, and in so doing he touched the dead man's cheek. It was not cold. Instinctively his finger sought a pulse. "'Stop! Wait!' he cried in his intense excitement. My dear Mrs. Arne, control yourself. But Mrs. Arne had fainted, and fallen heavily off the bed on the other side. Her sister, hastily summoned, attended to her, while the man they had all given over for dead was, with faint gasps and sighs and reluctant moans, pulled, as it were, hustled and dragged back over the threshold of life. 2. "'Why do you always wear black, Alice?' asked Esther Graham. "'You are not in mourning that I know of.' She was Dr. Graham's only daughter, and Mrs. Arne's only friend. She sat with Mrs. Arne in the dreary drawing-room of the house in Chelsea. She had come to tea. She was the only person who ever did come to tea there. She was brusque, kind, and blunt, and had a talent for making inappropriate remarks. Six years ago Mrs. Arne had been a widow for an hour— her husband had succumbed to an apparently mortal illness, and for the space of an hour had lain dead. When suddenly and inexplicably he had revived from his trance, the shock, combined with six weeks' nursing, had nearly killed his wife. All this Esther had heard from her father. She herself had only come to know Mrs. Arne after her child was born, and all the tragic circumstance of her husband's illness put aside, and it was hoped forgotten and when her idle question received no answer from the pale, absent woman who sat opposite, with listless, lacklustre eyes fixed on the green and blue flames dancing in the fire, she hoped it had passed unnoticed. She waited for five minutes for Mrs. Arne to resume the conversation. Then her natural impatience got the better of her. "'Do say something, Alice,' she implored. "'Esther, I beg your pardon,' said Mrs. Arne. "'I was thinking.' "'What were you thinking of?' "'I don't know.' "'No, of course you don't. People who sit and stare into the fire never do think, really. They are only brooding and making themselves ill, and that is what you are doing. You mope, you take no interest in anything, and never go out. I am sure you have not been out of doors to-day.' "'No. Yes. I believe not. It is so cold.' You are sure to feel the cold if you sit in the house all day, and sure to get ill. Just look at yourself. Mrs. Arne rose and looked at herself in the Italian mirror over the chimney-piece. 
it reflected faithfully enough her even pallor her dark hair and eyes the sweeping length of her eyelashes the sharp curves of her nostrils and the delicate arch of her eyebrows that formed a thin sharp black line so clear as to seem almost unnatural yes i do look ill she said with conviction no wonder you choose to bury yourself alive sometimes i do feel as if i lived in a grave i look up at the ceiling and fancy it is my coffin lid don't please talk like that expostulated miss graham pointing to mrs arne's little girl if only for dolly's sake i think you should not give way to such morbid fancies it isn't good for her to see you like this always oh esther the other exclaimed stung into something like vivacity don't reproach me i hope i am a good mother to my child yes dear you are a model mother and model wife too father says the way you look after your husband is something wonderful but don't you think for your own sake you might try to be a little gayer you encourage these moods don't you what is it is it the house she glanced around at the high ceiling at the heavy damask portieres the tall cabinets of china the dim oak panelling it reminded her of a neglected museum her eye travelled into the farthest corners where the faint filmy dusk was already gathering lit only by the bewildering cross lights of the glass panels of cabinet doors to the tall narrow windows then back again to the woman in her morning dress cowering by the fire she said sharply you should go out more i do not like to leave my husband oh i know that he is delicate and all that but still does he never permit you to leave does he never go out by himself not often and you have no pets it is very odd of you i simply can't imagine a house without animals we did have a dog once answered mrs arne plaintively but it howled so we had to give it away it would not go near edward but please don't imagine that i am dull i have my child she laid her hand on the flaxen head at her knee. Miss Graham rose, frowning. "'Oh, you are too bad!' she exclaimed. "'You are like a widow exactly, with one child, stroking its orphan head and saying, "'Poor fatherless darling!' Voices were heard outside. Miss Graham stopped talking quite suddenly and sought her veil and gloves on the mantelpiece. "'You need not go, Esther,' said Mrs. Arne. "'It is only my husband.' oh but it's getting late said the other crumpling up her gloves in her muff and shuffling her feet nervously come said her hostess with a bitter smile put your gloves on properly if you must go but it is quite early still please don't go miss graham put in the child i must go and meet your papa like a good girl i don't want to you mustn't talk like that dolly said the doctor's daughter absently still looking towards the door mrs arne rose and fastened the clasps of the big fur cloak for her friend the wife's white sad oppressed face came very close to the girl's cheerful one as she murmured in a low voice you don't like my husband esther i can't help noticing it why don't you nonsense retorted the other with the emphasis of one who is repelling an overtrue accusation i do only only what well dear it is foolish of me of course but i am a little afraid of him afraid of edward said his wife slowly why should you be well dear you see i i suppose women can't help being a little afraid of their friends husbands they can spoil their friendships with their wives in a moment if they choose to disapprove of them i really must go good-bye child give me a kiss don't ring alice please don't i can open the door for myself why should you said mrs arne edward is in the hall i heard him speaking to foster no he has gone into his study good-bye you apathetic creature she gave mrs arne a brief kiss and dashed out of the room the voices outside had ceased and she had reasonable hopes of reaching the door without being intercepted by mrs arne's husband but he met her on the stairs mrs arne listening intently from her seat by the fire heard her exchange a few shy sentences with him the sound of which died away as they went downstairs together 
a few moments after edward arne came into the room and dropped into the chair just vacated by his wife's visitor he crossed his legs and said nothing neither did she his nearness had the effect of making the woman look at once several years older where she was pale he was well coloured the network of little filmy wrinkles that on a close inspection covered her face had no parallel on his smooth skin he was handsome soft well-groomed flakes of auburn hair lay over his forehead and his steely blue eyes shone equably a contrast to the sombre fire of hers and the masses of dark crinkly hair that shadowed her brow the deep lines of permanent discontent furrowed that brow as she sat with her chin propped on her hands and her elbows resting on her knees neither spoke when the hands of the clock over mrs arne's head pointed to seven the white-aproned figure of the nurse appeared in the doorway and the little girl rose and kissed her mother very tenderly mrs arne's forehead contracted looking uneasily at her husband she said to the child tentatively yet boldly as one grasps a nettle say good night to your father the child obeyed saying good night indifferently in her father's direction kiss him no please please not her mother looked down on her curiously sadly you are a naughty spoilt child she said but without conviction excuse her edward he did not seem to have heard well if you don't care said his wife bitterly come child she caught the little girl by the hand and left the room at the door she half turned and looked fixedly at her husband it was a strange ambiguous gaze in it passion and dislike were strangely combined then she shivered and closed the door softly after her the man in the armchair sat with no perceptible change of attitude his unspeculative eyes fixed on the fire his hands clasped idly in front of him the pose was obviously habitual the servant brought lights and closed the shutters drew the curtains and made up the fire noisily without however eliciting any reproof from his master edward arne was an ideal master as far as foster was concerned he kept cases of cigars but never smoked them although the supply had often to be renewed he did not care what he ate or drank although he kept as good a cellar as most gentlemen foster knew that he never interfered he counted for nothing he gave no trouble foster had no intention of ever leaving such an easy place true his master was not cordial he very seldom addressed him or seemed to know whether he was there but then neither did he grumble if the fire in the study was allowed to go out or interfere with foster's liberty in any way he had a better place of it than annette mrs arne's maid who would be called up in the middle of the night to bathe her mistress's forehead with eau de cologne or made to brush her long hair for hours together to soothe her naturally enough foster and annette compared notes as to their respective situations and drew unflattering parallels between this capricious wife and model husband three miss graham was not a demonstrative woman on her return home she somewhat startled her father as he sat by his study table deeply interested in his diagnosis book by the sudden violence of her embrace why this excitement he asked smiling and turning around he was a young-looking man for his age his thin wiry figure and clear colour belied the evidence of his hair tinged with grey and the tired wrinkles that gave value to the acuteness and brilliancy of the eyes they surrounded i don't know she replied only you are so nice and alive somehow i always feel like this when i come back from seeing the arnes then don't go to see the arnes i'm so fond of her father and she will never come here to me as you know or else nothing would induce me to enter her tomb of a house and talk to that walking funeral of a husband of hers i managed to get away to-day without having to shake hands with him i always try to avoid it but father i do wish you would go and see alice is she ill well not exactly ill i suppose but her eyes make me quite uncomfortable and she says such odd things i don't know if it is you or the clergyman she wants but she is all wrong somehow she never goes out except to church she never pays a call or has any one to call on her 
nobody ever asks the arns to dinner and i'm sure i don't blame them the sight of that man at one's table would spoil any party and they never entertain she's always alone day after day i go in and find her sitting over the fire with that same brooding expression i shouldn't be surprised in the least if she were to go mad some day father what is it what is the tragedy of the house there is one i am convinced and yet though i have been the intimate friend of that woman for years i know no more about her than the man in the street she keeps her skeleton safe in the cupboard said dr graham i respect her for that and please don't talk nonsense about tragedies alice arne is only morbid the malady of the age and she is a very religious woman i wonder if she complains of her odious husband to mr bligh she is always going to his services odious yes odious miss graham shuddered i cannot stand him i cannot bear the touch of his cold froggy hands and the sight of his fishy eyes that inane smile of his simply makes me shrivel up father honestly do you like him yourself my dear i hardly know him it is his wife i have known ever since she was a child and i a boy at college her father was my tutor i never knew her husband till six years ago when she called me in to attend him in a very serious illness i suppose she never speaks of it no a very odd affair for the life of me i cannot tell how he managed to recover you needn't tell people for it affects my reputation but i didn't save him indeed i have never been able to account for it the man was given over for dead he might as well be dead for all the good he is said esther scornfully i have never heard him say more than a couple of sentences in my life yet he was an exceedingly brilliant young man one of the best men of his year at oxford a good deal run after poor alice was wild to marry him in love with that spiritless creature he is like a house with someone dead in it and all the blinds down come esther don't be morbid not to say silly you are very hard on the poor man what's wrong with him he is the ordinary commonplace cold-blooded specimen of humanity a little stupid a little selfish people who have gone through a serious illness like that are apt to be but on the whole a good husband a good father a good citizen yes and his wife is afraid of him and his child hates him exclaimed esther nonsense said dr graham sharply the child is spoilt only children are apt to be and the mother wants a change or a tonic of some kind i'll go and talk to her when i have time go along and dress have you forgotten that george graham is coming to dinner after she had gone the doctor made a note on the corner of his blotting pad mem to go and see mrs arne and dismissed the subject of the memorandum entirely from his mind george graham was the doctor's nephew a tall weedy cumbrous young man full of fads and fallacies with a gentle manner that somehow inspired confidence he was several years younger than esther who loved to listen to his semi-scientific semi-romantic stories of things met with in the course of his profession oh i come across some very queer things he would say mysteriously there's a queer little widow tell me about your little widow asked esther that day after dinner when her father having gone back to his study she and her cousin sat together as usual he laughed you like to hear of my professional experiences well she certainly interested me he said thoughtfully she is an odd psychological study in her way i wish i could come across her again where did you come across her and what is her name i don't know her name i don't want to she's not a personage to me only a case i hardly know her face even i have never seen it except in the twilight but i gathered that she lived somewhere in chelsea for she came out on to the embankment with only a kind of lacy thing over her head she can't live far off i fancy esther became instantly attentive go on she said it was three weeks ago said george graham i was coming along the embankment about ten o'clock i walked through that little grove you know just between shane walk and the river and i heard in there some one sobbing very bitterly i looked and i saw a woman sitting on a seat with her head in her hands crying i was most awfully sorry of course 
and I thought I could perhaps do something for her, get her a glass of water or salts or something. I took her for a woman of the people. It was quite dark, you know. So I asked her very politely if I could do anything for her, and then I noticed her hands. They were quite white and covered with diamonds. You were sorry you spoke, I suppose, said Esther. She raised her head and said, I believe she laughed, Are you going to tell me to move on? She thought you were a policeman? Probably, if she thought at all, but she was in a semi-dazed condition. I told her to wait till I came back and dashed round the corner to the chemist's and bought a bottle of salts. She thanked me and made a little effort to rise and go away. She seemed very weak. I told her I was a medical man. I started in and talked to her. And she to you? Yes, quite straight. Don't you know that women always treat a doctor as if he were one step removed from their father confessor, not human, not in the same category as themselves? It is not complimentary to one as a man, but one hears a good deal one would not otherwise hear. She ended up by telling me all about herself, in a veiled way, of course. It soothed her, relieved her. She seemed not to have had an outlet for years. To a mere stranger. To a doctor, and she did not know what she was saying half the time. She was hysterical, of course. Heavens, what nonsense she talked. She spoke of herself as a person somehow haunted, cursed by some malign fate, a victim of some fearful spiritual catastrophe, don't you know? I let her run on. She was convinced of the reality of a sort of doom that she had fancied had befallen her. It was quite pathetic. Then it got rather chilly. She shivered. I suggested her going in. She shrank back. She said, If you only knew what a relief it is, how much less miserable I am out here. I can breathe, I can live. It is my only glimpse of the world that is alive. I live in a grave. Oh, let me stay. She seemed positively afraid to go home. Perhaps someone bullied her at home. I suppose so, but then she had no husband. He died, she told me, years ago. She had adored him, she said. Is she pretty? Pretty? Well, I hardly noticed. Let me see. Oh, yes, I suppose she was pretty. No, now I think of it, she would be too worn and faded to be what you call pretty. Esther smiled. Well, we sat there together for quite an hour. Then the clock of Chelsea Church struck eleven, and she got up and said, Goodbye, holding out her hand quite naturally, as if our meeting and conversation had been nothing out of the common. There was a sound like a dead leaf trailing across the walk, and she was gone. Didn't you ask if you should see her again? That would have been a mean advantage to take. You might have offered to see her home. I saw she did not mean me to. She was a lady, you say, pondered Esther. How was she dressed? Oh, all right, like a lady, in black, mourning, I suppose. She has dark crinkly hair, and her eyebrows are very thin and arched. I noticed that in the dusk. Does this photograph remind you of her? asked Esther, suddenly, taking him to the mantelpiece. Rather. Alice! Oh, it couldn't be. She's not a widow. Her husband is alive. Has your friend any children? Yes, one. She mentioned it. How old? Six years old, I think she said. She talks of the responsibility of bringing up an orphan. George, what time is it? Esther asked suddenly. About nine o'clock. Would you mind coming out with me? I should like it. Where shall we go? To St. Adhelm's. It is close by here. There is a special late service tonight, and Mrs. Arne is sure to be there. Oh, Esther, curiosity. No, not mere curiosity. Don't you see if it is my Mrs. Arne who talked to you like this? It is very serious. I have thought her ill for a long time, but as ill as that. At St. Adhelm's Church, Esther Graham pointed out a woman who was kneeling beside a pillar, in an attitude of intense devotion and abandonment. She rose from her knees and turned her rapt face up towards the pulpit, whence the Reverend Ralph Bly was holding his impassioned discourse. George Graham touched his cousin on the shoulder and motioned to her to leave her place on the outermost rank of worshippers. "'That is the woman,' said he. End of section 6